Hi, I'm George and welcome back. This week we're going to do something a little different. We've had quite a few questions now regarding what kind of camera equipment we use for our videos and so we're going to have a look at our ground-based cameras as well as the cameras we use on board of our rockets. So the first up I'm going to switch cameras and so we can have a look at the main one and then we'll switch back and have a look at the rest of them. We use the Panasonic HC-X900M as our main camera for most of the ground footage and close-ups. Now it's a full HD camera that shoots at 1080p and 50 frames per second. What we like about it is that it has a good set of manual controls with an external mic when we need it. It has an optical image stabilizer which is very important for long distance shots. Originally when looking for cameras, what in part attracted us to this unit is that it had a 3D lens accessory option that would allow you to shoot in 3D, though we've never purchased it. Um, we still think we may do that in the future, but at $300 it's probably not worth it. Uh, four years ago this camera cost just under $1000, but these days you can get a similarly spec camera, but with a 4K resolution for a similar price. We also have a couple of smaller and cheaper HD cameras that we sometimes use for getting alternate angles of the more important launches. One is a JVC GZ HM200B and the other is a Panasonic HC V160. They have quite similar feature sets. We'll often set them up to get a reverse angle shot that records the back of the rocket. They're usually set up on a tripod somewhere. Although these should full HD, the video is only 25 frames per second and interlaced, which isn't ideal. These don't have a lot of features, but are nice and compact and very easy to set up. For slow motion, we use the Casio Exelum FC100. This camera is now quite old, but it is still useful for some video. With this one, we usually shoot at 210 frames per second, but with a frame size of only 480 by 360, today that makes for quite poor quality, but it's better than nothing. It can shoot at 1000 frames per second, but with a frame size so small that it makes it virtually useless for most things. One downside is that it doesn't record any audio in the slow motion, so often we have to slow down the audio from other cameras and add it back during video editing. Eight years ago this camera was around $400, but we're pretty much getting ready to replace it. We also used the GoPro Hero 3 Black Edition for a lot of the ground footage. Though this camera is again a few years old, it still performs great and with a waterproof housing makes it easy to put near the action. We haven't flown it on a rocket yet because it's a little expensive and it's also a little bit on the heavy side. We normally use it in its high speed mode for getting slow motion video, though on occasion we'll switch it to full HD when we need sharp video. The 240 frames per second slow motion is only at a frame size of 848 by 480, which isn't great, but it's still usable. The other feature of this camera that we often use is the Wi-Fi remote control. This is particularly good when the camera is near the pressurized rocket on the launch pad. Because of its wide-angled lens, we mostly use it for close-up action, either at ground level or on a tripod or a boom. Originally when we first started flying water rockets we mostly used to film on this JVC camera which was just an NTSC standard definition and interlaced video. It recorded onto digital tape. Now this camera has thankfully been retired for a few years. We typically mount the Casio and Panasonic cameras on a handle like this to allow us to film a moving rocket both in HD and slow-mo at the same time. We have a targeting reticle that makes it much easier to track the rocket one problem with trying to track it on a camera small screen is that when the rocket moves out of frame, it's a lot harder to find it again as you hunt around the sky for it. For still images, we use a variety of cameras ranging from small point and shoot type, including the Casio, that are good for general pictures around the launch site. For fast reaction photos, we've used the 14 megapixel SP800UZ Olympus camera for many years now. This is a good all-round camera for taking general photos for launches, and we usually use the multi-shot option that shoots at around 8 frames per second during a launch. It has a nice 30 times optical zoom so you can get a wide angle shot or a long zoom without the need to swap lenses. The one big drawback with this camera is that it is slow to save images. You could shoot say 30 frames in rapid succession but then had to wait 20 to 30 seconds while it saved all those to the card. The image quality wasn't that great on the fast capture mode uh, but much better than the point-and-shoot kind. Battery life was a bit of a problem too with these small batteries. 
Earlier this year, we've started using the Nikon D3400 with an 18 to 55 mm lens and a 70 to 300 mm telephoto lens as well. Now, this definitely is a step up in image quality and most of all speed. The response time is also a lot faster and no more waiting for anything. We're definitely very happy with this camera. Before we discuss the onboard cameras themselves, let's first have a look at where we've mounted them to get different views of the rocket in flight. Most commonly, we fly the camera looking down the rocket at the ground. For this, the camera is typically taped to the side of the rocket. To get a view slightly away from the rocket, we either mount it inside the payload bay or inside a fairing. Sometimes we mount it so that it looks directly at the horizon. To get this view of the rocket from above, we put the camera inside the parachute. When studying the nozzle and water behaviour, we mounted the camera on a small boom looking back at the rocket. In this shot, we mounted a pair of cameras on a much longer boom to see the entire rocket in flight. Here we placed the camera on a shorter boom looking up at the rocket at the deployment mechanism so we could see what it does. When studying how a rift parachute behaves shortly after deploying, we've mounted the camera on the shock cord itself so that it could track the parachute wherever the parachute went. Lastly, we've placed the camera on a variety of mounting brackets to look at various internal experiments. Okay, so let's have a look at the cameras themselves. Now, we've first started off with the JB1 camera. The JB stands for James Bond, uh, as it was marketed as a spy camera. Now, uh, this is the box that they used to come in. It's pretty nifty, and you can see how um, it slides out. Now, it claimed it was the world's smallest camera at the time, though I highly doubt it. Uh, now, it came in a full metal case that looked like a lighter, and it used a single AAA battery. Now, this camera wasn't much better than a potato with a frame size of 320 by 240 at 15 frames per second for a maximum record time of 30 seconds stored on the internal 8 megabytes. Now, despite its limitation, it gave us the opportunity to get our first aerial videos. Uh, we used a couple of these over a year uh, before we switched to the Flycam 2. The Flycam 1 was a little bigger, but had a great feature of being able to pivot the lens, which allowed you to mount the camera in different ways. It had doubled the resolution at 640x480 and 30 frames per second, and a better image quality uh, with a much longer record time. It recorded onto an SD card, um, but it suffered from audio sync issues, and it weighed in at 37 grams. Uh, we also had a couple of these, but when the internal battery failed in one of them, we added a bigger external battery that allowed us to record uh, for a lot longer. After these, we bought an MD-80, but at around $100 a piece, these were quite expensive. It was only about a third of the size of the Flycam one, uh, and the video quality was better with less compression artifacts. One problem it had was that it had a permanent timestamp over the video uh, that you couldn't turn off. Uh, later, a cheaper Chinese MD-80 clone became available for around 20 bucks, and that had the same shape, uh, but it was slightly larger. The video quality was similar, uh, but it did suffer from some dropped frames. It was half the weight, though, uh, due to its plastic case, rather than the much sturdier alloy case that the original MD-80 used. We then switched to the 808 uh, keychain series of cameras, uh, first starting with the number 11. Uh, these filmed at 1280 by 720 and could record for around 40 minutes on a single charge. Uh, they also recorded onto a small, uh, onto the micro SD cards. The image quality was much higher and these also had a 70 degree field of view lens. Now for wide angle shots, uh, we would sometimes use these uh, add-on lenses that we would mount in front of the camera. Uh, we used these for many years. Uh, after we smashed a couple, we then upgraded to the number 16. Uh, this had the same resolution, but had a few more features and uh, fixed a few bugs with the cameras. When the number 16 version 3 became available with the built-in 120 degree field of view lens, we switched to those, and those are the cameras that we continue to use today. The wide angle lenses are great as they allow you to capture more of the view, as you have less control about where the camera is pointing during flight. They're very sturdy and have taken quite a few hits over the years. 
We always put a piece of tape over the SD card slot because during hard landings, the cameras can eject the SD card, uh, which is impossible to find in tall grass. Now, these guys only weigh about 17 grams. There are much better cameras available now like the Mobius or the Runcam and their myriad of clones. Uh, these can do full HD or even 4K video, including higher frame rates. They are still a little bit on the expensive side and are in the sort of 40 to 60 gram category, which makes them suitable for larger rockets. And I think we'll uh, eventually upgrade to these as well. Uh, lastly, about 10 months ago, we bought a DJI Phantom 3 Pro. Uh, it's got a great 4K camera with an excellent stabilized gimbal, which gives us um, really rock steady uh, aerial footage, uh, even in windy conditions. We usually only film at 1080p at 60 frames per second, for smooth video, uh, we rarely would shoot in higher resolutions because all of our other videos at the lower resolution. And my son, uh, John, he's been doing a lot of practice with this one uh, to learn to track rockets. So that's it for this week. Uh, I've left links to the equipment uh, in the description. If you had uh, any more questions, please ask them in the comments below. And also stay tuned for the next video uh, where we'll have a major announcement of a big project that we've started working on. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.